Hello guys, Wilson here, and then today I'm going to be doing a video about um, the IGCSC Biology Syllabus, Topic 1, which is Classification. Okay, so basically, we're going to first talk about what is classification. Now, classification is basically the process that scientists use to put animals and living things into groups to make them easier to study. Now, this topic is a little bit long, so I'm going to split this topic into two videos. This topic has uh, seven little units, and then I'm going to be doing four of them today. Now, next, the most common factor that scientists use to classify living things is by the characteristics that they share in common. Now, what are they? There are seven characteristics that all living thing has, and they are, first one is growth, movement, sensitivity, excretion, reproduction, nutrition, and respiration. Now, growth is basically all organisms begin small and get larger by the growth of the cells and by adding new cells to their bodies. Movement is that all organisms are able to move to some extent. Most animals can move their whole body from place to place and plants can slowly move parts of themselves. Sensitivity is basically that organisms can pick up information about changes in their environment and react to changes. Excretion is that organisms can produce unwanted or toxic waste products as a result of their metabolic reactions, and these must be removed from the body. Reproduction is basically that organisms are, are able to make new organisms of the same species as, as themselves. Nutrition is when organisms take substances from their environment and use them to provide energy or materials that to make new cells. Respiration is basically all organisms break down glucose and other substances inside their cells to release energy that they can use. Now, here is the classification system and binomial naming system. Now, the system is uh, first thought up by a scientist named uh, Lianos, which is a Swedish scientist. Now, he came up with a method that uses seven groups to classify animals. Now, they are the kingdom, the phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, these four on the line is going to be our main focus here. Now, there are five kingdoms of living things. I'm going to be taking each of them in detail in this video. Now, genus and species make up the two parts of what is known as the binomial naming system. For example, the Donus plexippus, which is the Latin name or scientific name for the monarch butterfly. Take care that whenever you write these names in, in your exam or in a test, make sure you try to write them as best as you could in italic. And also, the genus is always capitalized. The first letter of the genus is always capitalized, and the first letter of the species is always a little letter. Next. Now, here I'm going to start to talk about the seven kingdom, the five kingdoms of living things. Now, we're going to start with animals. Now, animals are the most common living things on Earth. For example, us humans are animals, tigers are animals, cats are animals, and dogs are also animals. Now, they are, these are the main characteristics of animals. For example, they are multicellular, which means that they are made of many cells. And their cells have a nucleus, which contains their DNA and able to tell what the cells have to do. But they have no cell wall or chloroplasts. And all animals feed on organic substances made by other living things. Next, plants. Here's another kingdom of, of living things. They are also multicellular. Their cells have a nucleus. They also have a cell wall made of cellulose and often contain chloroplasts which they use to photosynthesize to make their own food. And the next point is it makes its own food by photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is carried out inside the chloroplasts of the, of the plant. And many plants have roots, stems, and leaves. Next. Okay, fine. Here's a picture of um, a plant. Now, you can see that the... The part of plant which uh, touches the dirt and which extends down into the ground is called the roots. And these uh, 
little little sticks that branch out. It's called the branches. And then the main the main branch, which extends all the way up, is called the stem. And these green big structures are called the leaf. Next is fungi. Now, fungi for a very long time were classified as plants, but now we know that they are really very different and belong to their own kingdom. The main difference is that they feed by saprophytic or parasitic nutrition, is that they cling on to other living organisms and then take nutrients from them. And also they do not have chloroplasts. And then they are usually multicellular, but some of may be unicellular. For example, yeast is a fungi and it exists by its own cell. It only has one cell. They have a nuclei, which is the same as plants and animals, but they have and they also have cell walls, but they are not made of cellulose. And then they feed by a, a hypha, which extends into the living organism that it is clinging on to. For example, you can see in this picture, uh, the hypha, which is the the long strand structure on the bottom, they use that to feed. Now, fungi do reproduce, and how they reproduce is by the spores, which are in the dark color here on the picture. In there contains spores, which can they can spread around to other areas by wind, and then once they plant it into the soil, they can start to grow. Now, the next kingdom is Proctotista. Now, the kingdom of Proctotista contains quite a mixture of organisms. They all have cell walls with a nucleus, but some of them have plant-like cells with chloroplasts, and others have animal-like cells without these features. Many of these, many of the living things in this kingdom are unicellular, but some, such as seaweeds, are multicellular. Here's a picture of a prototexta. You can see that it has the main structure of a cell that, it, that is normally found in a, in a plant cell. For example, you can see that there's a nucleus, there's a, there's a cell membrane, there's a cytoplasm, and there's a nucleus. This, there's also some chloroplasts. Well, this one, uh, it looks like a plant cell more. But the one thing that makes it look like more like an animal cell is because that it has a flagellum, which is a tail at the back. This flagellum helps us to move around. Well, the next kingdom and the last kingdom is prokaryotes. Now, prokaryotes is basically the kingdom that contains all the microorganisms that make you sick, for example, like bacteria. And there's a bacteria called E. coli that lives in your guts. It's also part of a prokaryote syndrome kingdom. Now, they are often unicellular, as what you found most bacteria are. They have no nucleus. This is one of the main things that, that di differs this kingdom from others, because inside their cells, they do not have a nucleus. They have what is called a plasmid and also a strand of DNA, which it contains all their genetic information. They have cell walls, but they are the same as fungi, not made of cellulose. But the, the, the substance that make up cell walls of prokaryotes is different from fungi. Now, they also don't have mitochondria, which means that they do not produce their own energy. Now, here's a picture of a bacteria, and you can see that uh, it has a cell wall, it has a cell membrane, it has this... DNA information, this plasmid in here, and then you, and you can also see that it has a flagellum as well. Now, the last thing we can talk about in this video is viruses. Now, viruses is not considered to be alive because it's, it does not fulfill the seven characteristics of living things. For example, it does not feed, it does not move, it does not excrete, it does not show sensitivity or grow or reproduce. It, does, it doesn't do all that. Well, some people may say that, okay, but, but once a virus gets, gets inside a human or animal cell, it starts to show these characteristics. But a th an organism is considered to be living if it can perform all these characteristics on its own. And viruses use other cells to do it for them. So it's not, it's, it's not living. Well, they cause some of the most deadly illnesses in the world that cannot be cured like AIDS. And also they work by getting inside living cells and force them to do their work. For example, 
how does a virus, for example, infect the human body? So basically, a virus gets inside a human cell. It forces the cell to make millions of copies of itself. And then the cell eventually bursts and, and send all these new viruses to other cells, which themselves get infected. Okay, a virus is really, really small. For example, if you take, like, for example, the AIDS virus, right? You can fit about 15,000 of these across 2 millimeters on your ruler. Okay, fine. Here's a picture of, uh, of the influenza virus. And you can see that it has a protein coat, which is the outer layer on this picture. And they also have this strand-like structures inside the middle. Now, this is its uh, genetic material. We call them RNA. Okay. This is, for example, like a simple structure of a virus. So basically, of all viruses have similar structures, but some have different structures. But all of them have a protein coat on the outside, and they all have a genetic material, which is called the RNA, on the inside. Okay, I'm going to end this video today. I hope you guys learned something from it. I'm going to talk about 1.5 to 1.7 in, in the next video, which is going to be uploaded fairly shortly after this. And then hope you guys enjoy. Thank you.